the progressive silence test and the artifact ready to be next with our agenda here. My name is Eric Olin. I'm a professor at St. Clair University School of Law. I've been at this today's uh, moderator for our panel titled Emerging Issues uh, uh, Secondary Liability in Trademark Law. Uh, to guide us through this discussion, we have five panelists. Uh, we have to my immediate left, uh, Mike Page from Jury Panel. Uh, we uh, have um, to his left, uh, Professor Mark McKenna from the University of Notre Dame. Also. To his left, we have David Bernstein from Dental Boys and Clinton. Uh, to his left, we have Stacey Dogan from Boston University School of Law. And to her left, we have Chris Sprigman from the University of Virginia. And uh, what we're going to do today, um, three of our panelists have uh, papers of the more formal sense uh, that they've been working on in connection with this project. Um, so we're going to give them first crack at the conversation. Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, David Bernstein, we'll move to Mark McKenna, and then we'll move to Stacey Dogan, and then I assume some sort of free-for-all will uh, uh, follow from there. Um, and so with that, uh, let me turn the panel over to David. Right. Terrific. Uh, Eric, thank you very much. I want to thank Eric for hurting us cats together, <coughs> and Holly and, uh, and the review for putting all this together. You have no idea how many logistical nightmares there were in planning this, and Holly's been amazing. Uh, and I want to thank my co-panelists because, unfortunately, I had a deposition the day that we had a planning session. And since I wasn't on the call, I got assigned to speak first, so I appreciate that very much. <laughs> There's a lesson in that for the yeah. students. <laughs> yeah, don't schedule depositions when you have important calls with other professors, for sure. <laughs> uh, you know, it's surprising to me, uh, to some degree, that the question of contributory liability in the trademark context has become so hot again. Uh, we thought this was settled 30 years ago. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled in the Inward Ives case. Uh, they set the standard on when you have a contributory liability in a trademark case, and that standard has actually stood the test of time for the last three decades. Uh, that was a case about generic pharmaceuticals. A, uh, a pharmaceutical product had become generic. A generic company was providing book like <coughs> pills. And then uh, the allegations were that knowing full well that pharmacists were illegally substituting the generic product for prescriptions for the real product, uh, to what degree was the company selling the generics responsible uh, for continuing to supply generic pharmaceuticals to pharmacists when they knew that this kind of illegal swapping was going on? And the test the Supreme Court set, which uh, is the one that has now uh, really been the focus of the Tiffany eBay decision, which I think is uh, one of the things we'll all be addressing, uh, is that you're responsible if you continue to supply a good and since then courts have also said we're a service, to one, who, uh, to one knowing that they are going to basically use it uh, to infringe. And so we have this concept that uh, you, know, you, you are doing something with knowledge. Constructive knowledge has always been something that the courts uh, have recognized as knowledge. And I don't think there's even any, like, uh, any dispute, although maybe I'll prove myself wrong, that willful blindness is something that has also been recognized as being a type of knowledge, a type of constructive knowledge. What I'd like to focus on is a different part, and that is when can you, when you uh, reasonably anticipate that you're providing a good or service to someone, and uh, they are going to be uh, infringing, or uh, in, in even in more extreme case, counterfeiting. So the standard that the Supreme Court set, I think, is consistent with a long history of tort standards. And I know that Mark will be addressing uh, this a little bit more, um, but if you look at the restatement third of unfair competition and going back to many previous versions of the restatement of tort, uh, in, in section 27 of the third restatement, it says that if you have knowledge of tortious conduct, and if you assist the tort fees, um, you then have a duty to take some reasonable precautions. And I think that's a standard that makes a lot of sense in this context of trademark infringement uh, as well, because after all, trademark infringement and counterfeiting is a type of tort. Um, the internet certainly is new, and that's what we are all talking about. The internet didn't exist when these tort contexts were developed. The internet didn't exist in, at the time of the Inwood case back in 1982. But I don't think that the existence of the internet means that we should throw out all of these decades of legal principles. The same legal standard absolutely is the standard that should apply, although certainly with different facts, how you apply that standard will be different. What kind of reasonable precautions a company selling generic pharmaceuticals might have to take to make sure that pharmacists aren't illegally swapping is very different from the question of what kind of reasonable precautions an 
internet marketplace <coughs> take to make sure that what's going on on their site uh, is not infringing as well. I think it's useful to look at how has the Inwood standard been applied by courts in the years since uh, Inwood was, uh, was uh, handed down in 1982. Um, we've had cases involving franchisers, for example. There's the Mini Maid <coughs> Services case in the 11th Circuit, where the franchisor what, knew that its franchisees of the Mini Maid, uh, ser uh, Mini -Maid Services uh, were, con were uh, in that case, it was uh, that there were serious and widespread violations <coughs> by the franchisees. And what the court says is, if you know there's serious and widespread violations, then it's assumed you had some knowledge and you're condoning it and you can be contributory liable. We have cases involving credit card processors, a very recent case in New York uh, that Gucci brought, where there was a counterfeiter operating a website. The uh, counterfeiter had a company that was processing payment for it. And Gucci found that the processing company, the company that was facilitating the payments, um, knew that the, that the website was selling replica products. In fact, on the website it says our products are exact mirrors and they're brand and box. And the, the payment company uh, actually helped create a form on the website so that when people would make their payment, they would get a notice telling them, hey, be careful, you're, we want you to know you're buying a replica. And they were characterized as a high-risk merchant. And so in that case, Gucci said, look, we're alleging that you know what's going on here. You're continuing to provide this credit processing service. You've got contributory liability. The court says that's right. We have cases involving landlords. Um, in New York, we've got uh, uh, Chinatown. I think in LA, it's uh, Santee Alley, which uh, has a lot of these problems. And the courts have ruled that if landlords uh, have knowledge or have some reason to believe that there's counterfeiting going on in their property, uh, they can have liability as well. And probably closest to the eBay situation and other online marketplaces have been the flea market cases, the Hard Rock case in the Seventh Circuit and here in the Ninth Circuit, Phono Visa, um, where again the courts found, uh, and I think the Phono Visa is probably the, the closest analogy, that uh, knowing that there was counterfeiting going on in the flea market gave rise to a, some kind of an obligation to take steps to try to minimize that or to prevent it. And it wasn't that they knew which vendor was specifically involved in selling counterfeits, but rather that they knew that there was counterfeiting going on. I mean, I think of it as the, the Casablanca ex example, you know? Uh, shocked, shocked to find out that there were counterfeit products, uh, in that case, uh, uh, recordings, musical recordings, being sold here at the flea market. And what the Ninth Circuit held is that uh, knowing that there had been 38,000 counterfeit recordings seized in the past, and having gotten a letter from the sheriff warning them that there's continued unspecified counterfeiting going on gave rise to an obligation by the flea market operator to do something. Those same standards are the standards that I think should apply in the internet context, but again, with full recognition <coughs> that different facts might give rise to different precautions, different things you have to do in response. Uh, I think everyone's familiar with eBay versus Tiffany, so I won't get into the facts. The key, the key finding by the Second Circuit was that Generalized knowledge that there was counterfeiting, counterfeiting going on <coughs> is not enough to give rise to contributory liability. The only thing that would give rise to contributory liability, the court said, is if you have, quote, contemporary knowledge of which particular listings are infringing. <coughs> so if the Second Circuit requires an extremely specific form of knowledge in order to give a rise to any kind of obligation, that the operator of that marketplace has to do something. And I think that is a fundamental error. I think it's inconsistent with inward against eyes. I think it's inconsistent with the historical court standards. And I think it's inconsistent with the way courts have applied the inward test in the 30 years since then. I actually think that the result was probably right. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think you can approach a case and say this is a good or a bad actor without knowing the facts. Certainly a lot of the facts that Judge Sullivan talked about at the district court level suggest that in that situation, eBay did a lot of things right. It has the Vero program. It does take things down. It employs a lot of filtering. It takes a lot of steps to make sure that it has a fair marketplace. And what I want to avoid is saying what eBay did here was right, but therefore the standard should be that unless you have contemporary knowledge of which particular listing is infringing, you're not liable. Because that's an extremely specific standard. And there are a lot of actors unlike eBay, who are not nearly uh, as responsible, I'll say, 
about the policies that, that, they, uh, uh, that they follow. You know, the, the idea, I think, should be, if you uh, can reasonably anticipate that there's going to be counterfeit, or that there is counterfeit or infringing uh, 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 conduct going on, that then you have an obligation, as, as the restatement in, of torts and unfair competition would say, to take reasonable precautions. It doesn't mean that if you have knowledge uh, or you can reasonably anticipate that there's counterfeiting going on, that you're automatically liable. Rather, it then says, okay, what have you done? What steps have you taken to try to prevent that? Do you do, you do notice a takedown? That's probably not enough, but that certainly is one good level. Do you do some kind of filter? Do you uh, have a mechanism so that when somebody uses the word like fake or faux or replica, uh, you immediately stop that? Do you have a policy in place that allows you to know who the customers are? Do you, uh, who the sellers are? If somebody is a repeat offender, do you bar them forever from that marketplace? Um, and do you have a mechanism of knowing that they don't just pop up using a different username? Example, so that you, it's the game of whack-a-mole. You stop them once, but they pop up in, in a different guy. And it's, and I don't think any of us can say what the reasonable precautions should be. I don't believe that what we should be doing is legislating and saying these are the steps you have to take. That's the kind of thing that courts are best at. Courts are best at looking at what are the facts in the situation and did you do enough. And once you've done what you did, did that seem to stop the problem, or has the problem continued unabated? Uh, Tiffany in the Tiffany eBay case, and, and we didn't represent either party, although I, I have filed amicus briefs at both the Second Circuit and at the uh, cert petition level. Um, it, it, there was evidence in that case that when Tiffany did a survey, something like 80 to 95 percent of all of the silver Tiffany jewelry being sold was counterfeit. And um, there, were, there were questions as to whether that was a fair survey. Uh, you know, they, I think, uh, in one small period of time, uh, randomly selected 100 uh, auction site uh, or auctions that were being offered and you know one could certainly say is that right or not but let me just assume for the moment that the survey was right let's assume for the moment that eBay did some things and despite having done some things 80 to 90 percent of the silver Tiffany jewelry offered on the eBay site still were counterfeit I think that would suggest wow maybe you need to do more and what is more e Tiffany wanted a rule that said if you sell more than five items uh, then uh, that's, a, that's a very large sign that you're probably engaged in counterfeiting. You know, if, if, uh, if my daughter wants to sell the, the Tiffany bracelet that she got from her bat mitzvah because she wants to get money for it, and that's a sort of one-off, that's fine. But when somebody is posting the same item repeatedly, that was uh, sort of a red flag that maybe they're making this in their basement and stamping Tiffany on it. Is that the right rule? I don't know if it is the right rule, but I think it's the kind of thing that courts should be involved in. And there needs to be a shared burden. I'm not suggesting that the burden is entirely on the online marketplaces. It is not. Brand owners have an absolutely shared responsibility for making sure that they are communicating with the online marketplaces, that they're telling them what they know. And the parties together should be trying to find a set of rules, a set of procedures that are going to work, not to eliminate counterfeiting, because you can't. And uh, thinking back to some of the comments this morning, we don't want a, rule, a, a world where there's absolutely no counterfeiting at all, but at the, same, at the same time, we're reducing a lot of legitimate sales. We need to find a fair balance. And I think that that's something uh, that courts are best able to do. So uh, I'll wrap up, because I know we'll be coming back to this. And I've uh, used my 15 minutes of fame now. Um, just to say, you know, where I would, what I would see as a much better standard is not focusing on the type of knowledge. I think the Second Circuit made a, a real departure from 30 years of law when it tried to characterize this as do you have generalized knowledge of counterfeiting, you know, the Casablanca situation, or do you know specifically exactly which listing is counterfeit and you continue to allow that listing name. Instead, I think what we should be looking at is um, can a marketplace, whether it's a single retail location, whether it's a swap meet that, uh, by the way, some of these flea market swap meets are acres and acres. I mean, you could walk all day and not be able to look at every, uh, every booth. But is it a physical location like a swap meet where at least you can walk up and down the aisle and see the good and see what's there? Um, or is it an online marketplace? Whichever it is, do you have, can you reasonably anticipate that there's counterfeiting or infringing, infringing conduct going on? And if so, what reasonable precautions have you taken?
So uh, we're now on to um, Mark. Uh, so first, I guess, uh, let me just add my uh, thanks to Holly and to the other uh, others on the uh, Technology Law Journal for putting this together. Uh, all of us who have uh, had the pleasure in the past of putting together conferences and symposia know the extraordinary uh, level of work that's involved. So. Um, thank you. Uh, there's already been a lot of good presentations, so my sort of most basic goal here is just not to screw things up uh, as we move along. Uh, and my paper is actually something of a response to David's. Uh, I had kind of hoped he would say something more unreasonable so that I could use it uh, as a target. Uh, it turns out that I think I'm... Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna write something up for you. Uh, so I, I think I, we're going to kind of disagree around the edges a little bit, but maybe not as, as starkly as at least I had anticipated. Uh, in the first place. Uh, so, so why is it my reputation would have been that I would have been unreasonable? Right? We'll do that later. Yeah, my priors are that people who represent mark owners tend to advocate much more extreme rules than I typically do. So I, uh, but so so I, I'll try to lay a little bit of that uh, to the side. So uh, David noted something that I think it's actually pretty well trodden ground in a lot of trademark cases, uh, secondary liability cases. The courts frequently say, and parties frequently say, secondary liability rules in trademark infringement, and probably this is true also um, in copyright infringement, derive from uh, common law of torts. Uh, and though it's common for them to make that assertion, there's actually surprisingly little effort to determine the extent to which secondary liability law actually tracks tort law principles. So uh, that's what I want to do, is I want to look at Kate, these cases, the trademark the liability cases through the lens of how trademark, uh, how tort law uh, treats the liability of parties uh, whose actions put others at risk of third party wrongdoing, right? which is what I think these cases really are. So more particularly, I want to focus on kind of the state of mind requirements or the knowledge requirements uh, that track uh, in those cases. So this is a bit of, uh, going to be a bit of an overgeneralization, but I think it's, uh, as at least as a general point, it's fair to say uh, tort law treats these kinds of cases, or these kinds of cases, I mean cases in which the party who's accused of violating someone else's rights, what they've done is they themselves have not done anything that would independently be considered tortious, but they have exposed somebody else to the third party wrongdoing uh, that really underlies the action. And I think tort law, broadly speaking, treats these um, in, you could either call this two or three ways. I'm going to break it out as three ways. The first is, uh, it imposes vicarious liability, and in vicarious liability cases, the defendant just stands in the shoes of the third party because of the nature of the relationship between the defendant and the third parties. Right? So obviously the, the paradigm case here would be an employment context, but you have some other uh, versions of this depending on certain relationships. Um, and I think the important point to emphasize here is that the liability in these cases is purely a function of the relationship. It's specifically not a function of whether the defendant has knowledge of the particular actions uh, that the party carries out on its behalf. So I, as an employer, am liable uh, by respondeat superior for the actions of my employee, and it makes no difference the extent to which I had knowledge of what they were actually doing under the circumstances, right? So there's a, you know, sort of a background caveat there that assuming the person's acting in the scope of their employment and that you employed them, but at least as a sort of knowing what they're doing under those under any given circumstances in a particular time. There's no knowledge requirement. It's just purely a function of the relationship. <clears throat> so I think it's fair to say that the trend in tort law with respect to those cases is to interpret the categories that give rise to vicarious liability pretty strictly and to sort of limit the extent to which you are considered a vicariously responsible for the, the acts of others. So that, you know, for the most part, parents are not vicariously liable for the torts of their children. You're not like vicariously liable for the acts of your spouse, right? There's a pretty strict set of a set of limits, right? So, there, so I'll call that the first category where uh, the liability results not really at all from anything about your knowledge, but just about the nature of the relationship. Okay. So the second category that I'll, uh, I'll flag is what I'm going to call a category of cases where uh, it's their knowledge as intent cases. So these are where defendants are found liable because they put the plaintiff at risk of third party wrongdoing that the defendant knows or should know uh, is substantially certain to result. <clears throat> right? So the liability here is actually for the intentional tort. Right? Knowledge or substantial certainty of outcome is treated as intent for that wrong to occur. Right? So in this, in this category, one case that I teach that's kind of a classic case is this case called Hudson versus Kraft. 
and there the court finds the promoter of a boxing match liable for the battery committed by the contestants in the match, right? And the basis for the liability is obviously in part that the promoter supplied the means if we created the, the boxing situation. But primarily, the liability is because uh, that the, bat the battery was actually the point of, of, of the lesson, right? So the idea was that they created a boxing match, and you can't very well say I had no idea that people would batter each other, right? I'm sure that's good. Yeah. So uh, these kinds of cases, right, and uh, these are sometimes called sort of accomplice liability cases, uh, I think they teach us something important because uh, these are where the, the courts are willing to say that knowledge rises to the level of intent, but in all of these cases, the knowledge that they look for is pretty particularized. So it's the substantial certainty that a particular person is going to inflict a particular type of harm. In Hudson versus Kraft, it's of course probabilistic in the sense that the fight promoter can't know with 100% certainty the combatants will in fact hit each other. Uh, but short of that, it's pretty certain, and it's pretty certain that they know who is going to do the hitting and when. Right? <clears throat> So some of the early secondary liability cases in the trademark area could conceivably be put into this category because those cases tend to speak a lot in the language of inducement or encouragement, right? But those cases also, I think importantly, they focus a lot on particularized information. So they focus on information about giving supplies to particular people um, <coughs> under particular circumstances. This is, though, I think the category of cases that probably best supports the kind of inducement standard that you get in Grokster. Uh, though I think it's important to note that Grokster focuses on much more, uh, much more speculative type of knowledge than these cases tend to do. So Grokster focuses on generalized knowledge of infringement by unidentified parties at unidentified times. These cases tend not to do that. Okay? So the third category of cases, though, is precisely that kind of case. These are cases in which the defendant is accused of putting the plaintiff at risk for some probabilistic harm. Right? And so here I don't mean probabilistic just in the sense that the promoter of the fight in Hudson versus Kraft doesn't know for sure that people are going to connect right, on any of their blows. But it's probabilistic in the sense that the defendant knows with some certainty that there's some chance of harm resulting from the actions of some other people, but the knowledge isn't particularized to particular people. It's just a statistical likelihood, right? So, for example, gun manufacturers know that some portion of the guns they produce are going to wind up in the hands of wrongdoers. They may not know which ones will be the wrongdoers, absent some additional specific evidence, but they know some of their guns are going to be used unlawfully. Nevertheless, tort law would not treat gun manufacturers like promoters of a prize fight because this difference in the particularity of the knowledge matters, right? It matters. Um, it matters uh, in particular about whether you would count them as intentional wrongdoers. Right? Courts have, though, in, case, in some cases, imposed liability on the basis of this kind of probabilistic knowledge where the third party wrongdoing is statistically likely. Uh, and there are sort of two kinds of cases here. One is where there's a likelihood of intentional wrongdoing by third parties. So the classic case that I teach in my torts class about this is a case called Hines versus Garrett in which a woman is negligently taken beyond her railroad stop by, the, by the, uh, the railroad. She is let off in the dark a mile past her stop and walking back, she's attacked twice. And the question is whether the railroad has some responsibility and the court says yes, because in that case it's pretty, it's pretty foreseeable that letting somebody off and making them walk in those circumstances is going to cause, is likely to result in harm, even though the railroad had no reason to know who would do the attacking or or when, it was just a statistical likelihood, right? The same sort of thing happens in some negligence cases where uh, they deal with the question of whether something like a negligent driver can be held responsible for the harms caused by negligent healthcare providers, right? And the theory is that healthcare providers' negligence, uh, that the, the injured party wouldn't have ever been exposed to the healthcare provider's negligence in the first place had the negligent driver not uh, caused harm. So. Uh, so what I want to try to do then is to say, well, what, do, what do we take from this and what should we say? And then the first thing I want to do is I want to just sort of go back and question to some extent the premise that I accepted at the outset, and that is that tort law should provide the basis for the secondary liability principles um, in IP. And I want to note one particularly significant reason why we might be concerned about drawing that analogy at least too strongly. So for the most part, the cases that I was just describing in tort law 
They involve liability for third party wrongdoing where the third party wrongdoing itself involves a state of mind. Right? So these are cases for liability, where the liability for third party intentional wrongdoing, like battery, or third party negligent conduct. Right? And with the exception of cases of vicarious liability, none of these cases involve liability for third party strict liability torts. Right? And in that case, in, in that respect, infringement is different. Right? Because infringement, both in the trademark and copyright area, has no state of mind requirement. So this would be, I think, a, a quite an extension of tort law to say we should uh, allow, uh, allow an action for third party, uh, for exposing someone to third party wrongdoing when there's no state of mind involved with the third parties. Right? That doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't make that extension, it just means we should acknowledge that it's an extension of what's happening in tort law. Okay? If we are, though, I think, to continue to rely on tort principles, it seems to me that what we should recognize is that what Tiffany is pushing for in the eBay case is to collapse the distinction uh, between, on the one hand, the first two categories I described, the vicarious liability and intentional tort categories, uh, and the latter category involving probabilistic harms. Right? So, so to be a little more specific, what they're asking courts to do is to incorporate the liability consequences from the first two categories, making the defendant liable for the same tort as the third party who was, was engaged in the wrongdoing, but to require only the probabilistic knowledge of the latter category, right? So this is a stark difference because what's really important to note about those cat cases in the third category with probabilistic knowledge is that they're negligence mm -hmm. cases, right? So to be specific, the promoter of the fight in Hudson versus Kraft is liable to the defendant for battery, right? Because the promoter's knowledge is treated as sufficient to constitute intent. This is true even though the promoter herself never actually strikes anybody, right? But the liability in the third category of cases where the knowledge is probabilistic is not for the same tort committed by the third party wrongdoer. Right? Liability in Hines versus Garrett is liability for negligence, not for battery. Notwithstanding the fact that the, the, the wrongdoers to, uh, to whom the woman was exposed were batterers. Right? So I think this could have um, some significant ramifications for secondary infringement law. This is where I was hoping I would disagree a little more strongly with David. So I think one thing it clearly does do is it suggests that what we ought to do if we want this to track tort law uh, is we ought to ask about the reasonableness of the precautions that were taken by uh, the party who's accused us of a secondary uh, infringer. <clears throat> now, so my take is that we probably would come out in a different place on what constitutes a reasonable precaution, but at least it's sort of common ground. It strikes me that in the Tiffany case, Tiffany's version of what constitutes a reasonable precaution is one that prevents all infringement. Right? And to me, that's clearly not what it means to say a reasonable uh, precaution. In fact, the, the way that this is framed always in tort law is to leave room for circumstances where there might be uncompensated harm. Right? There might be harm that results, but the burden of preventing that harm is simply too great to impose the responsibility to prevent it. Okay? So uh, on that sort of calculus, thinking about it, I'm just going to use the, the Tiffany versus eBay case as the example here. Uh, I think I have issues on both sides of the equation. So the burden that has to be counted here to me is not simply the cost to eBay of blocking Tiffany merchandise or making it more difficult, but the cost to consumers of the loss of legitimate secondary market for Tiffany merchandise. Okay? And so here I'll put, on, I'll put on sort of my cynic hat and I'll suggest to you that as much as anything else, it's shutting down these legitimate secondary markets that the trademark owners are after. Right? And so I can cite, we'll cite to you, so there's a recent uh, dust up in which Coach uh, was routinely sending takedown notices without, without, without looking at all into whether these were legitimate things, and they've been sued in a class action in the state of Washington. Uh, my sense is that that's kind of the tip of the iceberg of what winds up, what actually happens in these. Okay. On the burden side, though, I think it's uh, also worth noting uh, that as it's asked in the negligence context, and as it should be, uh, it's sensitive to the particular defendant's characteristics. So that what's reasonable as a precaution for eBay is not necessarily what every other actor would, would, would be expected to do under the circumstance. I think David and I agree on, on that score. Uh, on the other side of the equation, though, I would say, I think this is probably one place maybe we disagree, is that there remains in my mind some substantial uncertainty about the magnitude and the likelihood of harm to mark owners from the sale of non-legitimate mer merchandise. Right? The context is going to vary a lot here. Uh, but to the extent that both the buyers and the sellers know about the legitimacy or illegitimacy of the goods that they're buying, it's not obvious to me there's a lot of harm to be avoided here uh, through secondary liability uh, rules. 
so I'll, I'll finish, but the last thing I'm going to say about this is that I think viewing the cases as negligence cases also means, uh, one, that the measure of damages would be different, because the measure of damages would certainly not be statutory. They would be, uh, they would be measured in, uh, in common law tort principles. Um, maybe in some cases that wouldn't wind up being a different number, but it certainly would at least change the way parties uh, talk about it. But the most significant thing, I think, is that we ought to be spending a lot more time talking about something that we almost never see in trademark cases, and that is the concept of proximate causation. Right? There's no discussion in trademark law, as far as I can tell, of what constitutes causation. There are actually competing bodies of, of, of uh, there are competing ideas about proximate causation in tort law. Um, one place that there's a flashpoint here is the extent to which third party intentionally, intentional wrongdoing cuts off the chain of causation, right? So in particular here, to the extent you're talking about third party intentional infringement, there's a significant strain of proximate causation law that would say that that, that liability no longer runs to eBay because you've got third party intentional wrongdoers. That's at least a conversation we have to have if we're gonna treat this as tort law principles. Uh, and, uh, and, and I don't see in any, any of these cases. So uh, I think I'll stop there. Can I ask one question? Sure. How does that work with your Hudson example? of the attackers who attacked the woman who was walking the mile back. Why, in the toilet example, why doesn't that then absolve the railroad? Yeah, so I think this is why I say it's a split of, this is not the only view of proximate causation, right? There are other proximate views of proximate causation that focus just on foreseeability, for example, and so third party wrongdoing is sometimes foreseeable. And if you take a foreseeability view of proximate causation, then you would say that that doesn't cut off liability. So, I think the point is, is that you've got kind of a rich de debate that's quite long about what the right proximate causation rules are, and it's a debate we don't have in the trademark context. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, Stacy. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm happy to report that between this morning and these guys, um, pretty much everything I have to say has already been said. But Mark will um, retort, as he always does, that won't stop me from saying, from, from speaking for too long, Stacy. Um, I have a paper just that long just long enough. That's right. I have um, a paper that, uh, like Fred said this morning, is um, in progress. Um, but I thought what I would focus my comments on um, right now is pulling together the comments, not all, or responses, not only to what these two guys have just said, but also the relationship to some of the materials we talked about um, this morning. Um, the theme of my paper is really that both copyright law and trademark law with a specific em emphasis on trademark law, but both of these areas of law to some extent are heading toward an approach in which courts um, know it when they see it. They view intermediaries as either good guys or bad guys. And good guys are entitled to a broad safeguard, right, in the, in the copyright context. The Sony safe harbor applies, or the DMCA safe harbor is applied to people that are perceived to be good guy actors. Uh, in the trademark context, um, the safe harbor um, that David has been talking about here, not as a safe harbor, but I think we can think of it as such. This rule that you need to have actual knowledge of specific instances of infringement before you will be found to be liable, um, applies against people who the courts view to be basically good guys. And I think we can see this trend across the case law in both of these different contexts. Um, and the interesting thing to me is to observe the fact that it is happening and to note that some similarities are emerging from the cases in what facts the courts look at as um, uh, determinative of whether, one, whether a party falls into the good guy or the bad guy um, camp. Interestingly, those facts don't tend to be the facts that are defined by the black letter lines in the, in the court's opinions. So I think it's... Um, descriptively interesting to kind of grapple with these questions and, and um, understand them. Um, to some extent, um, I think in both contexts, the real drivers behind the outcomes um, are facts that are um, at least superficially, um, uh, at least peripheral and perhaps irrelevant um, to the standards that are established by the courts in these cases. And I think Tiffany is actually a good example um, of this. Um, I think the real drivers are what is the defendant's economic motivation and business model? And uh, what design choices did the defendant make in 
um, uh, uh, bringing that business model uh, to market. I think the, the courts give lip service to the idea that design choices are irrelevant. I think they really determine uh, outcomes um, in these cases. In the end, um, I think courts are muddling toward an approach that is ref reflected in my understanding of the Supreme Court's normative analysis in the Sony case. Everything comes back to Sony but not in the way everyone thinks it does. Um, my understanding of Sony really focuses on the court's, uh, one key sentence in the court's opinion, that the goal of the staple article of commerce doctrine is to strike a balance between an intellectual property owner's legitimate demand for effective, not merely symbolic, protection of its intellectual property rights, and the rights of others freely to engage in substantially unrelated areas of commerce on the other. I think in this good guy, bad guy analysis, the courts are really trying to identify cases where the defendant is trying to engage in behavior that is substantially unrelated to infringement and to protect consumers' access to that behavior um, and to distinguish those cases from people who are primarily motivated by helping infringers um, on the other, whatever it is that the courts say about um, all right, let me just quickly defend my um, good guy, bad guy approach. It's actually, I, I think, that's st stated um, either explicitly or implicitly by a number of the speakers this morning and just now, so I'll just spend a couple minutes um, on it. Um, in the Grokster case, um, you know, as it made its way up to the Supreme Court, um, many people, uh, well, the, the defense was um, primarily motivated by um, reliance on the Sony absolute safe harbor, right? A safe harbor that said, it doesn't matter who the character of the defendant is, as long as this technology has a substantial amount of infringement use, it will be protected um, from liability. So the, quote, doctrine leading up to this case appeared to offer absolute immunity. Um, but the Supreme Court, as we all know, was having none of it, right? It said um, it adopted the inducement theory, um, which it instructed the courts to use to distinguish between people who seemed to really want infringement to take place on the one hand, um, and people who were not intentionally helping people to infringe on the other. Now, as Tony pointed out, it didn't give us a lot of guidance as to how to make that distinction. And in fact, the, the facts relied upon by the court in that case were pretty thin. Right? Um, design choices, on um, uh, the fact that uh, the defendants went after former Napster users. There wasn't really specific acts in which they were sending emails to individuals saying, use our system to infringe. Um, but nonetheless, the court seemed to be trying to get at this question of whether this business model and the motivations behind this product or this service were really reliant on and existed um, in order to perpetuate um, infringement. Um, so the business model and the system design, which the court sort of gave lip service to the irrelevance of, I think really did motivate the court's um, decision in that case that um, these guys really wanted infringement to take place. They weren't, um, they, they, they um, were really being disingenuous by saying, no, 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 we're just offering a technology that third parties um, are using. Um, to infringe. So in sort of characterizing so the Grobster, I think it's an example of a court um, rejecting a rule that would have given immunity to parties that the Supreme Court thought were really wrong to use. I think we see similar trends um, in the trademark um, cases. Um, um, everything always comes back to Sony, but Mark accuses me of having everything always come back to trademark use. Um, but as um, Mark Lovely and I tried to argue um, for a number of years um, in favor of a doctrine, a, a trademark use doctrine that would find direct liability only against parties that had actually used a mark as a brand for their own products or services, the Second Circuit in the Rescue.com case viewed that proposal as a kind of absolute immunity for intermediaries that would prevent it from rooting out bad guys. In that case, the court said, no, nah, we're going to be um, uh, completely agnostic as to whether Google was a good guy or bad guy in this case. But we want to preserve the tools to impose liability against in intermediaries in the event that they are designing their systems in ways that are designed to try to deceive consumers. Right? So this is another example of a court resisting a doctrine that might have you know, established some cr 
clear rules. Um, I think the doctrine actually wouldn't have prevented liability against scoundrels, but the court did think it would have. And adopting an approach that says, um, we want to reserve it for ourselves to impose liability against people who are um, willfully trying to confuse um, consumers. Now, the Tiffany and eBay case, I think, does something similar. Um, David's not very excited about um, the opinion, but it's interesting both for the protection that it offers eBay and for the room that it leaves for imposing liability against bad guys. Um, the rule that was adopted by the Second Circuit here was that there is no liability absent specific knowledge of specific instances of infringement. But why did the district court spend so many pages of its analysis talking about all of the efforts that Tiffany went to to try to prevent counterfeit merchandise from being sold on its site? I'm sorry, eBay. Um, yeah, Tiffany made a lot of efforts too, um, uh, but uh, not uh, quantitatively um, as many. But yeah, why give so much attention um, to this issue if it's irrelevant to the legal standard that is adopted by the court? Um, I think it helps to resolve this good, by, good guy, bad guy question in two ways. Number one, from a business model perspective, it helped to support the idea that eBay's business model was not designed to promote the sale of counterfeit merchandise. In fact, the court believed at least that eBay's interests were aligned with the interests of mark holders. Now, I understand that Tiffany takes issue with that, and I think there may be some reason to think that eBay might benefit from the sale of counterfeit um, goods, at least when consumers won't know what they're buying. Um, but putting that aside, both the district court and the Second Circuit um, were persuaded by the fact that as a business model, eBay really wanted to offer a legitimate um, uh, forum for people to buy and sell legitimate merchandise. And these efforts were evidence of that underlying business model. So they were evidence of the fact that eBay was a good guy, right? that eBay fell into the good guy uh, paradigm. And given that, eBay was entitled to a broad safe harbor Right, rather than to a stricter standard of liability that would have applied against it if we had seen system design choices or business model that would suggest um, that it was really, really, um, whatever it said, really trying to promote um, infringement. Um, so I think the, all of this discussion in both the Court of Appeals and the District Court of Opinion go to both to the equities of the case and to this question of whether eBay was really, um, as in Sony, trying to engage in an area of commerce that was substantially unrelated um, to uh, counterfeiting or to trademark infringement. And if so, the principles of Sony apply in the copyright context, and the principles of Sony apply in the trademark context as well. Courts should take their hands off, and courts should allow this firm to continue with its behavior uh, to provide these services that are of interest um, to consumers. At the same time that it adopted its legal standard and engaged in all of this discussion of facts that seem to be totally irrelevant, um, the Second Circuit um, noted the existence of two different doctrines that could be used to impose liability against bad guys, right? the willful blindness doctrine and the inducement doctrine. Now, we don't know what inducement means. We have some cases in, um, in uh, addressing inducement in the trademark context. But um, as little as the case law is developed in the online context, in the copyright context, um, it's, it's even less developed um, in trademark law. So we don't know what inducement <coughs> turn out to be. But it may be that we see inducement in trademark law turning out to be this kind of squishy, malleable concept that we see in copyright law that it is a tool used to identify people whose real purpose seems to be to help other people um, to infringe. All right, so I, my basic submission is that these cases suggest that the courts are really trying to get at what I think the Supreme Court's normative goals were in the Sony case, right? Trying to preserve the ability of people to engage in um, uh, behavior that is substantially um, unrelated um, to infringement. Um, and we see some real convergence um, on this point in both um, the copyright and trademark um, cases, trying to preserve tools to impugn 
deliberate wrongdoers trying to preserve broad safe harbors uh, to protect those people who are not deliberate wrongdoers and who are engaged in productive um, activities. At the same time, I think there are some differences between copyright and trademark law and some reason for special caution in the trademark area. As much as there's reason for caution in the copyright area with these squishy doctrines, I think there's reason um, for special caution um, in the trademark area. One reason for caution has to do with the distinction between trademark law and, um, and, and copyright law in the alignment of interests between intermediaries and content owners. The celestial jukebox that we heard so much about this morning, um, this sort of image of the world in which content owners and intermediaries, everybody is better off when everybody cooperates and offers content uh, to the public and everybody gets paid, simply doesn't exist in the, in the trademark um, context. While um, there may be some circumstances in which the interests of the intermediary and the trademark owner are aligned, for example, the Second Circuit thinks that the interests of eBay are aligned with the interests of trademark holders in preventing counterfeit sales. In other contexts, trademark holders have interests that are quite different from the interests of intermediaries. Right? They would prefer that no one other than themselves be able to use their trademark for any purpose whatsoever. They would prefer that no one be able to use their trademarks to sell resale products, to refer to competing products, um, so we can't even in an ideal world imagine a world in which all of the interests of the parties are aligned. And we can, we can assume that trademark holders are going to continue to push hard, um, uh, even as technology evolves, um, for limitations on the use of their trademarks um, by third parties. Um, paired with that, we have the fact that the range of legitimate uses of trademarks is um, even broader than the range of legitimate uses of copyright, copyrighted works. And we heard this morning about all sorts of transformative fair uses of copyrighted works that are uh, frustrated um, when um, uh, filtering and other efforts to reduce infringement exist. Um, it's not just fair use that is legitimate um, in the trademark context. Right? Um, referential uses are legitimate, descriptive uses are legitimate, sale of um, products bearing the trademark at, at resale uh, are legitimate uses of trademarks, and any use that doesn't confuse consumers right, is a legitimate use of a trademark. Right? So um, that too, I think, needs to be taken into account by courts in trying to decide um, subjectively whether a uh, defendant is um, developing a business model that unfairly uh, uses um, trademarks. And finally, that leads me to um, the final observation that we always need to worry about the free riding instinct um, in trademark cases. Judges are inevitably, or many, many judges, inevitably respond to trademark holders' um, fairness um, objections, um, that it just isn't fair when someone uses my mark to call attention to a competing product, even if nobody is likely to be confused. And we saw this in the Ninth Circuit's decision um, you know, several years ago in the Playboy Netscape case. Uh, we saw it in the Brookfield case in the Ninth Circuit. There are all sorts of circumstances in which courts respond to trademark holders' objection that it just doesn't seem fair for a party to use my mark to call attention to a product that competes with me and could deprive me of revenues. Given the squishiness of the subjective inquiry into whether people are good guys or bad guys, I think it is really important that the courts of appeals and hopefully someday the Supreme Court establish clear rules that instruct lower courts to avoid the free riding instinct and to avoid applying these squishy doctrines in ways that um, prohibit people or that, that, um, find, that put intermediaries into the bad guy category merely because they have allowed people to so-called free ride on trademark holders' um, investments. Um, thank you very much. Um, Stacey, I'm going to go a little out of order because I'd like to just understand your point a little bit more. Um, you made the case that um, the courts are distinguishing between good guys and bad guys. And, Except for the last point about the risk of over-responding to free riding, it wasn't clear to me if you thought that was a good thing or a bad thing. 
strike me that in many cases, um, that's exactly what we want courts to do in to apply their equitable discretion in cases, is to make that sorted between good guys and bad guys. Yeah, I actually didn't mean to be critical of that. I, I think, um, you know, I've written about Sony and suggested that I think that this is the, the appropriate understanding of the Supreme Court's opinion in this case, and that the goal of intermediary liability ought to be to try to support people who are offering socially valuable products to society, but to try to root out the people who, whose services owe their very existence to infringement. And I think you can do that on sort of the big picture level. I think you can do it on a granular level as well. This is where design choices, I think, can come into play in some circumstances. So the Gucci Frontline case, I think, is an example where the defendants in that case had engaged in certain practices that suggested they absolutely knew with whom they were dealing and had specifically enabled um, known counterfeiters to um, get access to their credit card services and had charged them a higher fee for doing so. So while we may say that these credit card um, servicers are providing a valuable service, this piece of their credit card service um, I think can be kind of isolated out and identified as um, a design choice that they made that was specifically geared toward infringement. So I actually didn't mean to make that. I, I intended this to be a descriptive account of what's happening implicitly in the cases and not really acknowledged by the courts. Um, and I think in many ways it's a good thing. I'm a little worried about its squishiness um, um, in situations where courts might uh, respond to the wrong analysis. Uh, so what we're going to do now is turn it over to some intra-panel discussion. And uh, Mike, if we could start with you, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Actually, I, I agree very much with Stacy, having, having done both Rockster and Rescue Tom, that we're seeing decisions made so that you can decide who the good guy is and the bad guy is. I think that's a very bad thing, however. Um, I remember walking out of the Rockster argument and after swearing him to be off the record, telling a reporter who asked me what I thought was going to happen, I said, I can tell you what the opinion's going to say. It's going to say, Sony's good law. Grokster loses anyway. Look over there. <laughs> it's like, and, you know, it was going to be, and that's what happened. We ended up with the inducement standard, which is an absolute mess. We now see in, you know, Tiffany and, uh, uh, and other cases, just as courts look to, to patent law to figure out the, the secondary rules in copyright, they're now looking to copyright law and the DMCA for trademark rules, and we're going to see the same kind of rules supported there. And inducement is going to be a mess if somebody doesn't sort it out. Because it, you know, it's not a separate, it, the problem with the way it was applied in Rockster is that um, whether or not you you're, should be subject to a safe harbor, it should be in terms of the acts you are performing that are relevant to those safe harbors. Imagine a scheme where, the, imagine Switzerland, where they have all sorts of rules where banks can have immunity for a whole lot of things if they follow rules. It's okay to put cash in the box and not tell anybody whose it is. It's okay to do this as long as you report that, right? All sorts of safe harbors we give to banks, right? Imagine a scheme where somebody came along and a, a banker came along and said, you know, Charlie does his cash deposit every Friday night. You ought to go grab him. And then he comes to the bank, right? It would seem absurd to go, all the protections the bank gets under the laws go away because you also induce somebody to commit a crime. On the other hand, it would be absurd to say, you shouldn't be liable for inducing the crime of hitting Charlie over the head and stealing his money because you're also a bank, right? They're completely different subjects, right? And the, when, when you start going, okay, all of the safe harbor schemes that you built into in the copyright context, the DMCA, in trademark context, the law, all of those go away if there's also an inducing act, just makes a mess of things. If you induce somebody to commit a crime, okay, you may be liable for inducing them to commit a crime. If you stored their material on your website, well, the DMCA will tell you what you're liable based on whether you follow the rules. But they should cross. Um, and I think one point, I don't think there's nearly as big a diff uh, gap between Ives and Tiffany as you do. Um, I, I think you're skipping past what is it that was being supplied with knowledge by the defendant. 
in odds, it was a whole bunch of counterfeit or you know, unlicensed drugs that were all going to be used, mislabeled, right? And the act was continuing to give those pills to someone you knew was mislabeled. In Tiffany, on the, in eBay, on the other hand, it, the good isn't continuing to give people silver bracelets knowing they're going to mislabel them as Tiffany. It's continuing to give a, a, a random set of people an environment where they can advertise, some of whom you know are legitimate, some of whom you know aren't, but you don't know who they are. We have plenty of cases where we deal with newspapers who had, where people advertise criminally, right? You can have 20 classified ads and 10 of them sell you know, uh, bogus goods and 10 of them sell legitimate goods. The solution there isn't to say, newspaper, you're liable if you continue to publish and make available to those people that resource. The remedy is you're liable if you continue to print the ones you know are fake. But not, you have to eliminate them all in your life. Um, so I have, I have a, I want to modify my response a little bit to Eric's question in response to, um, to what you just said. I actually think that um, it's not a bad thing that courts are grappling with trying to distinguish between parties who are trying to offer a socially valuable service um, and are caught in the web of others' infringement on the other, on the one hand, and people who have um, the core business model and goal of promoting infringement um, on the other. I'm not, I think I agree with you that inducement is a kind of a poor fit for us to get Just there. Don't make up new laws to do it. Use the ones that are there. Well, but, but see, but I think... I suppose that's right, although I would disagree with Grokster's approach to what level of substantial, uh, what level of non-infringing use is sufficient to make the safe harbor appropriate. I mean, I think um, if you view Sony, as I do, as trying to protect people in uh, offering to the public products that are really, products and services that are really substantially unrelated to infringement, I don't think that that goal is satisfied by saying if someone offers a service that could conceivably at some point in time be but, used, not but for that was the legal issue the Supreme Court should have reached. Yeah. Is 99% yeah. infringement non-infringing? Is 50%? What does Sony mean? Yeah. And can you, can you, you know, that's the legal issue they should have reached instead of going, oh look, inducement. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. They, they, they decided it's, all of the factual issues yeah. that weren't in front of them and none of the legal issues that were Yeah. The problem with the, 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 the problem with this Grokster debate is that I actually don't think it applies at all in this situation. Because if we go back to Inwood, Inwood said there are two standards for contributory liability. The first is, did you intentionally induce the infringement? And that's a much higher threshold. And that was not found here. And that was not the allegations in Tiffany. And then the Supreme Court says, uh, all right, if you didn't intentionally induce, there still can be contributory liability if you continue to supply the good to someone who you know is uh, using it to infringe. And I do think there's a big gap between Tiffany and what happened in Inwood. Because in Inwood, first of all, they weren't mislabeled drugs. They were real generic drugs. They were just generic. So you had a, you had a prescription for it for the, for the brand. But they were and selling to the guy they already knew were mislabeling, that specific guy. They, they, they weren't mislabeling, they were switching yeah. the generic for, for yeah. the brand drug. I mean, the consumer is still not getting a fake drug, they're not getting a counterfeit, they're still getting a drug. And what was interesting is in Inwood, um, you don't have to know, and the court said you didn't, or I have, my read of it is, you didn't have to know which of the pharmacists were doing this. It wasn't the actual harm, and indeed Inwood relies quite a bit on the old Snowcrest case. Where bars. So can I interrupt? Where, yeah. where in the opinion do you think that the, the court said you don't have to know which individual pharmacists are doing this? There was not, they didn't have the specific versus generalized. Uh, the Sony read it as having a specific versus generalized. I mean, certainly as, as read by the Supreme Court in the Sony case, it would, did require specific knowledge. Under the inducement part? Or on, are you saying. No, when it was talking about um, when Sony was distinguishing the copyright context from the trademark context, it said uh, clearly there would be no liability in this Sony case if we were applying the Inwood standard, because that only applies to situations in which the defendant is providing 
the tools to infringe to a specific party that it knows to be engaging in infringement. And, there, and I think there's a, and the Second Circuit picks this up when they make a huge deal about the use of the word one in that statement, knowingly providing a service to one who, who you know is uh, infringing. But the court also relied quite a lot on the Snowcrest case. And in Snowcrest, this is the First Circuit, 1940-something case, where bars were, uh, people were walking into bars, routinely ordering rum and coke, and um, the bars were switching them and giving them polar cola and rum instead of Coca-Cola. Uh, and what was clear in Snowcrest is the court said, you didn't have to know which bars were doing it. There were unnamed bars in the Snowcrest case who were doing it. You didn't have to know which bars were doing it, but that was their, their business model of polar cola was to support this business practice. And so even if you didn't know which bars were doing it, you still had the liability if you uh, knew that this was happening or could have anticipated it was happening and continued to supply the service to them. Yeah, so, but that's the inducement. So uh, we're going to suspend this. <laughs> this, this, this <laughs> we're going to turn over to Chris and we can come back to Yeah, I want to know more about Polar Cola, actually. But before we go back to that, I'd like to see if I can add to this conversation, not so much we're talking a lot about cases, but we're talking a bit about the economics behind um, eBay decision. So I guess I'll start with a case. Um, and that's uh, United States versus Carol Towing, right? So there are a bunch of barges in a the harbor. They're tied up to each other. Um, there's a storm that comes along. One of the barges breaks away, and it does a huge amount of damage. So the question is whether a precaution should have been taken that wasn't taken. The precaution is should there be a captain or a deckhand on the barge at night to retie the barge if the mooring lines start to chafe. And this would cost some money to put the captain or the deckhand on the barge, but it would also, of course, reduce the likelihood of accident. So Judge Han, Judge Learned Han, comes to the case and he says, well, look, let's think about this in economic terms. Let's think about the cost of the burden, right? That is said to be um, effective in reducing the likelihood of injury. So the burden, B, um, that should be taken, should equal the cost of an accident, L, times the probability of it occurring, right? B equals PL. So there's a simple mathematical formula. It's oversimplified, but I think it's a good way to kind of discipline what I'm about to say. Okay, so apply that formula um, to the eBay case. Okay, a couple of observations. First of all, the, the L, the harm. I think the harm caused by counterfeiting is often overstated, right? Some people are fooled by counterfeits, and there's some evidence in the eBay case that there are people who can call up or write to eBay and say, hey, you know, I thought I was buying a real Tiffany um, piece of jewelry and instead I got a counterfeit. But most people are looking for counterfeits and they want counterfeits, right? And why is this? It's because counterfeited luxury goods are cheaper than uh, genuine luxury goods. And there are lots of people who cannot afford to consume the genuine luxury good, but would very much like to confer on themselves at least some portion of the status of the genuine luxury good, and so they consume counterfeits. So um, is, this, is this a kind of action that harms? Well, um, surprisingly, there's relatively little empirics on this, but there's a recent study by a professor at the MIT Sloan School of Management that says she took two and a half years and she looked at people buying counterfeit handbags, also some counterfeit sunglasses, and she says, well, these people wouldn't have, these were not people who would have consumed, for the most part, the branded good when they bought the counterfeit, but in many cases, these counterfeits served as what she called aspirational purchases. They signaled some intent on the part of the people that when their life circumstances changed and they evolved, <coughs> they would be able to afford the um, branded. And in about 40% of the cases, within two years, the people who consumed the counterfeits actually bought a genuine product of that brand. Right? So there is a argument that counterfeits are like a gateway drug. <laughs> Firms like Versace, Gucci, or Tiffany. Um, so, um, there are some people who say, well, the harm isn't really at point of sale, right? There isn't very much confusion at point of sale, and to the extent that people are buying counterfeits on purpose, they're doing so aspirationally, or there's not really much harm because they wouldn't have bought the rent in the first place, but there's other ways that could be harmed, but principally they say there's post sale confusion, right? So, think about athletic shoes. So, say uh, Puma athletic shoes, and uh, someone's counterfeiting Pumas, and people are buying Pumas, and the people who are buying the counterfeits are not confused because they're buying them on some table in Santee Alley in Los Angeles, and they're paying 10 bucks instead of 80 bucks. They so basically know what they're getting. They're getting a counterfeit, but then they're putting them on their feet, and they're walking around, and their friend sees them and says, ah, oh, that's a Puma. That, that friend may be confused, but the question is, well, what's the harm, right? 
Well, this is an apparel good, right? This is a luxury apparel good that's being counterfeited. And so, because of the way apparel works, apparel markets, if the friend who's confused sees the puma and says, oh, those are getting trendy, then the friend might actually go and buy the legit puma. And since fashion consumption often happens within trends, post-sale confusion in the fashion context or in the luxury of this context, or, which are often quite trend-driven, our consumption depends on whether people we esteem are consuming that good. This may, in fact, cause benefit to the branded firm, right? Not harm. So the L, the B equals PL formula, is pretty chancy. Right? Now, note, I'm not talking about pharmaceuticals, right? Um, say you want to consume an antidepressant and you buy a counterfeit antidepressant, you know, actually, as it turns out, the placebo effect in antidepressants is very powerful, so you might actually get a pretty good pop for your counterfeit. <laughs> you're not at least getting the active ingredient, or maybe there's a danger to it as well. So counterfeit pills, counterfeit airplane parts, different situation, right? <laughs> for the most part, we're talking about counterfeit luxury goods, and these are counterfeited for a reason. Like the counterfeit are because of the price differential. The harm story is complicated. The harm story is also endogenous on the legal rules that we have. So now, after eBay, what you're going to see, I would bet, on eBay is more information being provided by brand and manufacturers allowing people to distinguish between the brand and the counterfeit for the purpose of preventing real confusion about the source of products. They can't prevent people who want to consume counterfeits from consuming them, but they can at least prevent the kind of fraud that adheres when people want to produce the, consume the genuine, but consume the counterfeit. Right? So we're going to get because of the eBay rule, I think over time, more information and the degree to which people are actually confused versus just engaging in knowing counterfeit purchases is going to shift. It's going to shift on the margin toward less real confusion. Okay, so the L is both smaller than some people say it is, and it's, it's sensitive to the rules. We can reduce it. But what about the B? So here's another problem. Okay, what's the burden? Um, that eBay would have to take on to stamp out counterfeiting. Well, if they're going to stamp out counterfeiting, they're going to have to reduce or maybe even eliminate, or at least subject to very stringent tests, deals, right, a market in any kind of branded good that can be counterfeited, right? So this rule isn't a one uh, plaintiff only rule. This is a rule that would be applied across the board. Now, what, what is eBay's business case, right? eBay's business case is that they've made a huge variety of markets much more efficient. That they've made markets in baseball bats much more efficient. Right? They've made markets in counterfeit goods much more efficient. They've made markets in gray market goods much more efficient. They've made markets, very annoyingly to the branded firms, they've made markets in used versions of genuine branded goods much more efficient. And of course, these used markets compete with the new markets for the genuine branded goods. It's especially when there's a big price differential between used and new. Okay. In order to stamp out counterfeiting, right, especially a lot of the counterfeiting that doesn't necessarily do a great deal of harm to the brand firm, you would have to take measures that would restrict trading in every category of good, whether it's gray market or used or actually counterfeit, that could be subject to counterfeiting. Right? And that's going to be a significant burden, not just on eBay, which is, after all, a private firm. We put burdens on private firms all the time. But a burden on all of us. It's going to reduce social welfare quite substantially because it's going to bring us back to the status quo ante where markets in these kinds of goods weren't as deep, weren't as liquid, weren't as geographically broad. Right? So that's the price that would have to be paid in the B part of the B equals PL formula. Okay, so what do I see when I look at this? I see a lot of kind of legal rules being thrown around, right? A lot of precedents being marshaled. But I think my reading of the eBay case basically tracks Stacy's. I, th I think the legal rules themselves are not that constraining. I think the court in eBay took the Inwood test and basically applied it to a specific factual context. And in this specific factual context, given the burden of precautions, some precautions, reasonable ones were undertaken, others were not. But the burden of precautions and the Frankly, the, the not stunning magnitude of the likely harm, um, the, the judge, it seemed to me, the Second Circuit, came down on the side um, of economic efficiency. This seems to me, whatever you think about the precedent, or whatever you think about eBay's fidelity to Inwood, this seems to be a sensible ruling. Okay, so what does this suggest to me? Well, a couple things. First of all, it's, it's odd, but true, that the, the, the Congress has left to the courts the development of secondary liability doctrine, right, both in the trademark and the copyright context.
this. They, they don't mandate anything in the law. It's basically up to the courts. The courts have been creative in a series of cases, sometimes in a not so productive way, sometimes in a productive way. I think this is a productive act of creativity, but I don't think this is a new rule. I don't think that going forward, we're going to see a rule that generalized knowledge is not enough in, the, in, in general, right? That I think in this particular factual setting, generalized knowledge of infringement not enough, but in another factual setting, I think we might see a quite different rule. Second conclusion is, you know, trademark law is a body of law that is built essentially on an empirical proposition that um, unauthorized use of the same or similar marks will confuse consumers, that consumer confusion will lead to harm, right? And when you start looking at it, the, the simple appearance of this start to break down, and what's called for is, a, is more attention, more serious attention to the appearance of consumer confusion and how it actually could harm mark owners, how it could harm social welfare, or how it could help mark owners and social welfare. This is something that we're just beginning, and I hope the eBay case is the spur for a lot more of a serious, rational, scientific inquiry into the appearance beneath these claims. So, I, I just react. And so, I mean, first of all, obviously, I like uh, talking about harm since I just spent like two years of my life writing about that. But um, I mean, one of the things I keep thinking as I'm listening to to you and to Stacy and to Mike is that what I think is going on in a lot of these cases. I think just descriptively, it's right to say what eBay is is a negligence case, right? And all they're doing is evaluating the reasonable precautions that eBay took. We would be, I think, well served for the court to say that, yeah. and for the court to say this is what we're actually doing is doing this evaluation. I think trying to push on some of those variables. But I think what actually a lot of the secondary infringement cases do is they put a lot of pressure on uh, underlying theoretical debates that are not settled in trademark law. So first of all, I think it puts a lot of pressure on the question of the extent to which trademark law is about consumer protection versus producer protection. So I'm totally with you. That's why I said what I said about the harm when I say, you know, to the extent people on eBay are buying counterfeits that they know they're counterfeits, it's not obvious to me there's a lot of harm to stop there, right? But that's viewing trademark law very much from the side of it's intended to prevent fraud and it's intended to protect consumers, right? You don't get agreement from that on trademark owners, right, in particular. So it puts a lot of pressure on the, the, the underlying theoretical debate about the purpose of trademark law. And it puts a lot of pressure on, even if you accept right, one or the other side of that, the, ex the difference between sort of confusion or deception on the one hand and everything else on the other, the sort of status good, free riding, sort of the extent to which those things constitute real harms. And so this is, although really about, this is a sort of specific instance about secondary infringement, really it's just a flashpoint of all those other things. Sure. Mm -hmm. but, but I, I tend to agree that the negligence analysis is useful in a lot of cases, particularly here where when you start looking at that, you know, the L in that analysis, there may be a harm. Tip, you know, Tiffany may lose money when somebody who knows perfectly well they're buying a counterfeit buys a counterfeit on eBay instead of that. But it's not a trademark harm. It has nothing to do with But that's what I mean by law. It's a question of sort of point. what's the underlying premise, right? right? If the but, harm you're trying to prevent is consumer deception, it's but, not a harm. Right. And if it's, yeah. But more to the point, I think you're jumping past the, are we sure we're, if you're going to uh, analyze this as a negligence case, where does the duty fly? flow from to begin with. You've left right pat right over if you run an internet website, you have some duty to prevent this harm. We have hundreds of instances where we make policy decisions that that duty doesn't exist. We never get to negligence. Baseball teams don't get sued when people get hit by foul ball because we've made a decision that that's not going to be a duty. Gun owners don't get sued when they get used when, when they get used. Porsche doesn't get sued every time there's a car crash, even though they build a whole lot of cars that will go 200 miles an hour and know perfectly damn well that some of them are going to hit walls. Yeah. So, so a, as a, as a, that, you can't just assume that there is a duty that you can apply negligence law to without figuring out where it comes from. Yeah, so maybe we, we, we may disagree about this, but I think my view is that all of those things are right, but none of them are about duty in tort law. So that duty is really arises from the act of creating, the, so there's an act of mission distinction that's important, but the act of creating the environment, the question of what is... Building a car that goes 200 miles an hour, right. it's an act that creates an environment. Yeah. I, I Building a baseball stadium. The that's lack of liability there doesn't derive from the lack of duty, it derives from what's the cost of the additional Yeah, and each of those cases is the holding, so in so baseball it's implied, it's, it's there's some yeah. kind of risk, yeah. right? And in cars it's kind of the same thing, you buy a car knowing it goes 200 miles an hour. You know, plus you're breaking the law, so that's intervening, you know, <laughs> illegal conduct that breaks the chain of causation. I mean, they, yeah. every case yeah. is always a, it's the common law, right? It's one case at a time and there's always an out. Mm -hmm. 
So um, it's always it's always enlightening to come to the academy because there's sometimes <laughs> I think, uh, an incredible skepticism among academics about what brand owners are all about. And um, uh, and so I think uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to hear this view that trademark owners want to stop every single sale of their goods. I mean, I represent trademark owners every day, and uh, I actually, you know, will I say there are some bad actors? Was Coach a bad actor in this case? I don't know. I don't know what the facts are. The facts will develop in court. We have a system that's designed to say if you're a bad actor, you will get punished. Not simply, Stacey, because someone, the judge says, I know it when I see it, I know you're a bad actor, but because we have a set of standards, and the courts look at those standards, and they look at the facts, and like the frontline uh, case with uh, Gucci, um, that was a credit card processor who clearly was pushing for uh, that kind of uh, that kind of business model, getting getting people in who they knew were counterfeiters or were certainly skirting as close to that line and possibly over the line as possible. I don't think we can say just because there's coach, therefore that shows that all brand owners want to stop everything that's illegal. I also think it's a uh, uh, you know I, it's it's certainly a provocative argument to say counterfeiting is good. Brand owners should love this. It's a gateway drug. My client <laughs> Louis Vuitton spends millions of dollars a year stopping counterfeiting. If they thought that allowing counterfeiting was actually going to allow them to sell even more products and make more money, you know, that, I guess, is their judgment to make. But Louis Vuitton is the same, actually, it's it's the the same journalism we had with the record industry, where we were going, look, if you guys would just open your eyes, this is a much better model than we're really you know, I don't think we need to go here. I, I, I really don't think we need this debate because I think even if you accept, I think it's, a, it's an interesting one, and I, I, I tend to sort of be in the middle of the road on this. I think it's an empirical question that I think has not yet been uh, proven one way or another. But even if we accept that counterfeiting is a bad thing, I think the BPL analysis in eBay got it right. I think when we think about, if we think of counterfeiting as harmful, and if we think of eBay as having a duty to create its environment to act reasonably to try to avoid the harm, to invest whatever investments would prove to be fruitful and cost effective to avoid harm, eBay did that. The interesting thing for me is that, the, or an interesting thing for me, is I, I feel like design choices are the big elephant in the room in all of these cases, that the courts don't want to get granular about design choices. And what the, what, one of the things that Tiffany was looking for to do in that case was to start questioning specific individual decisions that eBay was making, like you know when someone's offering five or more goods, that, that establishes that they're an infringer. And the court said, you know, we don't want to do that. What we want to do is to be able to look at this decision and say, look, under the circumstances, it seems to be acting reasonably to take precautions that would be effective in reducing um, infringement. And I think that the court, you know. Whatever you feel about the harms or benefits of, of counterfeiting, um, I think that analysis applies. I, I completely agree that uh, that that's the right analysis. And in, in my longer paper, which uh, well, I guess you see when it's published. I mean, I spent a fair amount of time talking about what should be done here is promoting economic efficiency. We should be looking at who has the who, where is it most economically efficient to put the burden to take some steps to try to minimize the infringing conduct or the counterfeiting conduct. What troubles me about Tiffany and the Diva is not what the result was. Because on the facts of that case, where the court found that Tiffany really did make a showing that there was 90% uh, uh, counterfeiting, and the court found had criticisms of that, of that study that was done. And I agree with you, the court goes on at length about the precautions that Tiffany takes. Although at the district court level, I think that was in part to show that eBay didn't know which uh, items were counterfeit. But what I would have liked, and I think it's something that, that Mark said, is to have gotten an honest uh, explanation of why. Because it's, it is, as a litigant, I can tell you that it is not true that I'm not going to have to deal with this statement by the Second Circuit in motions to dismiss and motions for summary judgment, where the Second Circuit says, you know, uh, exactly Unless there is contemporary knowledge of which particular listings are infringing, there's no liability. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll face dismissal yeah. of motions. I, I think that's fair. I, I put to my students yesterday this question. So let's suppose that you're representing a new online marketplace, right? You, they, you just set up shop, you are the in-house counsel, and they come to you as in-house counsel and say, what do we have to do? 
And one of my students said, respond to notifications of infringement. That's it. And I said, well, what if it turns out that you could do a very, very simple search for counterfeit, <laughs> right? And cut off a bunch of auctions. Do you think you'd be required to do that? And here's where the cost-benefit yeah. analysis comes in. And I think that, you know, that but, was implicitly informing the court's analysis. But, but you right. built in already the policy decision. You decided that we're in a Calabrese world where whoever the most efficient lawsuit avoider is has to take it. The, 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 the ball, and the DMCA actually did exactly the opposite. We did a very different world there, whether that happens in trademark. When Dean Grokster, one of the, uh, uh, actually not Grokster, I had a case much earlier on, uh, uh, on your side, um, uh, looking at whether we could get a different auction site to cut down counterfeits of video game cartridges, and it was rampant. There were like, you know, ripped cartridges, ripped discs, etc. A lot of the ads were really obvious that, you know, this is a counterfeit, you need this code. Some were less obvious. Uh, we, are, we had our expert do a lot of work on, uh, to try to see whether the auction site was correct in saying, you really can't tell which ones are. And so what we did, we, we put together some keywords and we did an empirical test of, you know, search by these keywords, Go do a bunch of purchases, see how many false positives you get, see how many false negatives you get. They were, re nothing was very reliable. It was impossible to tell which ones from the ads were, were, were bogus or real, with one exception. Every single ad that had the number 127 in a footer explaining in the Copyright Act section 127 made it legal for you to make this back up was bogus. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, we, um, can we suspend the discussion for a little bit? I'd like to hear from the audience. And if we have more time, I know we'd be ready to mix it up. But why don't we turn to the audience? And as usual, I think Mark London may have the answer. <laughs> no, he has the answer. Yeah, well, I mean, if I want to. I want to approach eBay, Tiffany, from a, from a different perspective, and it focuses on Chris's idea of, uh, of tort law, right? I mean, David Bernstein says he doesn't quarrel with the result in the case. I think one of the reasons he might not quarrel with the result in the case is eBay does a hell of a lot to try to track down and get rid of infringing content on its sites, right? It, does, it isn't perfect, of course, but it does a heck of a lot, right? It creates a whole verified owner's program that does affirmative uh, uh, searches to try to go out and find these things that proactively tries to identify and eliminate infringers. And I guess the question, thinking about the court's opinion from the tort law perspective, uh, is whether the risk of the court's opinion is not that it doesn't uh, protect trademark owners enough, but that it sets effectively as a standard in this tort law mentality, uh, a rule that's based on uh, here's one company that has gone to extraordinarily lengths to try to eliminate counterfeiting. That's okay. Uh, and kind of by, hypoth by, by uh, extension, anybody who doesn't go that far uh, is going to not be, uh, it's not going to be so fortunate. I think this is actually why it would have been really useful for them to have talked about this explicitly in tort law framework. Right? Because tort law, I mean, Negligence liability in tort law is, in, is sensitive to that, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's very clear in a whole bunch of cases that what is, net, what is a reasonable precaution for certain people to take is not the same for other people. It's sensitive to circumstances. So I think the court could have said very clearly, if it had just laid this out as a negligence case, look, for, you know, for a company the size of eBay and given the resources that eBay had, these are the, this, this set of precautions was a reasonable set. It's not necessarily true of everybody else, right? So I'm, I have to say, I confess, I'm a little on the fence about this because on the one hand, like I share the concern that that does seem to impose a lot of liability. I also, and I, I, I say this about the sort of design choices too, um, I don't have that discomfort at all in tort law. I don't have the discomfort at all that courts are willing to look at a very case-by-case -case basis to see what additional precautions. And in fact, in tort law, they, they very often look at design choices. They very often say, how did you design this car and could you have designed it differently? And those never bother me. So I'm just, I, in, within myself, I can't resolve why it bothers me here and it doesn't. I think this is an opportunity though. I mean, there's a risk that you identify, but the opportunity is that, again, you would think if you came to trademark law from Mars and just read it for the first time, that it's set up to kind of launch a bunch of empirical inquiries about harm. But it turns out that, you know, there's very few empirical inquiries about harm in individual cases. Instead, we assess harm through a bunch of proxies that are actually very weak, right? And I think what's interesting about these secondary liability cases is because the underlying 
liability is pretty clear, right? The secondary liability allows you to assess whether the theory of harm, at least with the secondary liability, is strong. So I think, you know, if I were another um, market and I hadn't taken quite as many precautions because my cost of taking precautions, for example, was higher, I would, I would say my cost of taking precautions is higher, and I would press very hard on the L. I would try to do everything I could to suggest that look, people know what they're getting, um, you know, and the harm to the mark owner is notional, and just try to whittle the harm down and, and take my chances that way. I understand that this is hard, but I think over time, um, trademark might look more like a typical tort case where you get these inquiries. Uh, just on that, uh, I do want to tie this back to the question that Matt Necco asked earlier uh, today about uh, standard technical measures and copyright, and whether those act as a uh, uh, a form of basically locking in incumbents, and I think one of the hard parts of this case is eBay is saying this is great for us, but there are a lot of entrepreneurs saying we can't afford to do what eBay does anytime and maybe never, and so this is not necessarily a favorable win for the industry as well. So the industry well, maybe this is just reading it with you know rose-colored glasses, but I think that that's part of the problem of doing all the reasonable inquiry stuff, Rosa, right? Is that they should have done it on the surface, and you could have at least. Out at some of that. Maybe that wouldn't have solved the whole problem, but doing it sub rosa gives you doctrinal rules that look like they're not really about that, right? When that's really what it is about. And so another court is going to say, well, look what eBay did. No wonder they had that rule. Maybe you shouldn't get that rule. You, it would have been more, it would have been better, I think, if they had been honest. And, and I intend to do oral argument. And actually, I think the, uh, the brand owners community uh, felt pretty good about how the argument went because one of the big topics of discussion in oral argument from the bench was. We want to make sure that we set a standard that will encourage innovation to the state of the art. That if the state of the art develops that you can do better filtering, that eBay automatically, without great expense, can stop more counterfeiting, we want to make sure that we set a standard that's going to help support that. And so I left the oral argument thinking, wow, it sounds to me like the court is headed in the right direction, right being just a line that the word in mind. Why was the word so categorical? So you have two sides, basically one side saying the rule should require specific knowledge, the other side saying the rule should require generalized knowledge. Why doesn't the mark owning community say, well, this isn't really so much about the rule, there's a negligence framework here. What we're concerned about is the failure to stop hosting listings of five or more infringing products, right? Because that's a small additional fee. Because we're not thinking about it in tort law state terms, right? This is the point is it's gotten, we sort of internalized 30 years ago that this came from tort law, but then we don't read the tort law cases anymore. So what happens is, I mean, the way to map this onto tort law is to say when you have specific knowledge, it's like an intent case, right? In which case you're liable for trademark infringement if you don't debate the, uh, the efficacy of, of uh, precautions you could have taken because you intended the result. When there's not intent and it's generalized knowledge or probabilistic knowledge, then it's a negligence case. And then we have to evaluate sort of what the alternative precautions are. And that's, I think, the way it should be. So the alternative argument is it's generalized, but this one precaution would have cost you know, a right. small number of dollars. Why didn't they take it? Right. And, and you know, again, I represent Tiffany. My understanding is that Tiffany uh, and eBay were very close to settling. But ultimately, the case did settle, which is unfortunate, because I do think that what Tiffany was asking for was probably not so difficult for eBay to do in its case, but eBay was very concerned about are we setting a standard that's going to come back to haunt us against others, even though, you know, if you look at it from this, I mean, I think Mark and I are actually very closely aligned. He's playing negligence. I'm, I'm thinking about it in terms of reasonable anticipation, reasonable precaution. Um, if Tiffany is able to show, look, we've gone out and done a good study, and every single time somebody has more than five of the exact same items, it is counterfeit. And that would, and you know, that would be a very easy rule for you to apply. To apply, and by the way, we'll even have an out. If somebody says, "No, I've got more than five, but this is the reason why," and you know, has some opportunity, as Mark said before, to, or maybe it was uh, maybe it was Fred who said before, "Look, we have a simple form. You just click the button, say, no, I'm certifying it's true. I got five of the same, or six of the same pieces of jewelry, uh, or I had a huge credit at Tiffany." I had to use it because it was going to expire in three days. I went and bought these things knowing I could sell them on eBay. That you'd have a way to say, okay, you, you can do that. And I think what concerned eBay was, oh, how is this going to hit us in other right. cases? In every torts class first year, when you talk about BPL, you say, well, one difficulty is a litigant could serially litigate precautions and kind of ratchet them up because in, in isolation, each precaution looks efficient. Right? I'm wondering why 
that you know, strategy just to get this. One thing, I mean, one, the one middle ground, though, is, I mean, if you're, if you're concerned about sort of, you know, the, the, the runaway cost of this thing is that, you know, forcing the market owner to identify the precaution, right, rather than just saying you should have done more, right, and then litigating about well, what's the more and everything. You know, you, Mark Over, tell us what the, what the precaution is and tell us why it would work. That's right? yeah. and Trust you know, me, they'll come up with one and you won't like it. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and I like the economic yeah. efficiency point is, if that were the way courts went, the brand owner community could actually fund the creation of better technology. That, you know, I mean, you could imagine that they could say, we really don't like counterfeiting. We don't think it's a gateway drug. I'm, I'm a little surprised to hear how much uh, love there is of thinking, you know, counterfeiting is not so terrible because, it, I mean, it's actually not even a, a, a civil crime, a civil uh, violation. It's a crime. Yeah, that's a script. But, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but in any case, but in any case, if you did have this as a strictly, if you did have this economic approach saying where can the burden be lessened, you could have a situation where an organization like the International Trademark Association, and I see Laura and Ruby here, and these are issues that we're debating quite a lot in, into right now, uh, or brand owners or IACC, could actually say, you know, we've come up with this tool that's uh, going to be very inexpensive for the uh, online community to uh, use, and now we're delivering it to you. Now you've got to bring yourself up to the state of the art. You could see how the burdens could be shared on both sides if we were all aligned for saying, Let's find the most economically efficient way to stop this. Yeah. When can but we then, place our order? Yeah. But at the end, at the end of the day, though, you have to have agreement about what you're trying to stop, right? And what the scope of the rights should be in the first place. And I think that's part of it. We have deeply unresolved issues. Yeah. So let's see what else we have from, from the audience. Other questions? Uh, let's try over here. Um, yeah. So I, I want to just sort of echo something that Mark McKenna was saying and sort of push back maybe a little bit on this question. So. Um, you know, because uh, Mark was talking about the ways in which it's sort of these, these normative issues that are underlying these questions, right? And it sort of raises the question about whether or not you can really take such a strong economic, empirical-based kind of analysis of this, right? Because it seems to me at the end of the day, I mean, I think Chris talks about all the reasons why there's potentially low harm, right? But it seems like the potential high harm is the, is if you think about a world in which you just don't have trademark law at all, right? That you might not be able to create the status goods in the same way. Now, now the question is, is that bad or not? Or how should we think about that? Or how bad is that, right? It seems to me that that's a sort of normative question which then feeds back into all of these questions about uh, uh, how you could actually go about doing an economic analysis. So you've got a new, uh, uh, you've, got, you've got a new proposal for, for a, a small D uh, precaution that you could take, but then without being able to say normatively in some sense, how we're going to measure the loss of status goods to society as a harm, one way or another, it seems hard to figure out how to run the economic analysis. I don't think that problem's on the table, though. I don't think anyone's talking about the loss of status goods. So people are going to arrogate status to themselves in some way or the other. And the trademark law, even if you cut it back to its core, is going to protect against consumer confusion that results in some harm to the mark owner. Right? So to the extent that counterfeits do, in fact, compete with the brand, the genuine brand good for patronage, you know, then we have something to talk about. To the extent that they don't, then you have to articulate the harm some other way. And what, what I'm waiting for is someone to articulate the harm, where there's no effective competition. There's also this perspective that trademarks about luxury goods. And, you know, for sure, luxury goods like Louis Vuitton handbags are, are, are counterfeited, and they're sold for a ridiculously low price, and at least the purchaser generally knows that they're not getting a real Louis Vuitton handbag. You do have the post-sale confusion issue. You know, there are other issues as to whether there's dilution of the brand, not dilution in a, in a trademark dilution perspective, but just the loss of status because also to people who you don't think should be able to carry a Louis Vuitton habit, so it's not yeah, like what I real one. <laughs> but there's a tremendous amount of counterfeiting that I think um, uh, is not recognized enough of just everyday goods, shampoo products. And, you know, when we talk about Tiffany silver jewelry, I know Tiffany sounds like a luxury brand, but a lot of this silver jewelry is $100 or less. And it, these are actually people who just want a piece of silver jewelry, and they don't know that they're wearing zinc. And, and Tiffany has lost those sales. Well, but, I, I mean, I think the issue there is that you have this weird edge case of, of luxury goods. Or, um, somebody's got to be wearing Stanford sweat, sweatshirt in here somewhere. Uh, you know, or university branded goods, right? Uh, goods where we deal with them as trademark cases, but they aren't really trademark cases. 
you're buying the mark. The mark is the product that you are purchasing, not the indicator that let you know what product you're, you're purchasing. And then you have what we think of as traditional trademark things, which is, I bought a Ford last year, I liked how it ran, I want, I want, I, you know, the car I buy this year, I'm going to go to the same guy, right, a, a source identifier. And they're really, you get really weird distortions of the law when you mix the luxury good I, I, end of it, where, as Mark points out, most of the people on eBay are going, yeah, of course I know it's counterfeit. It is I want a fake. Yeah, I mean, I think this, this comment, though, does, does um, reinforce the idea that if we did have a rule that said counterfeits are, are okay as long as you're incorporating the mark or the product features as kind of an intrinsically valuable piece of the product that the consumer knows that the product doesn't actually come from the trademark holder, just wants to um, buy it for the value of uh, the incorporation of the mark in the product. It, it's hard to draw lines, right? Especially when you have copying of some products where the price differential is not so great, right? And so courts no, no, no problem. There's, there I mean, are a lot of gray areas, right? The liability is great example. right, right, right. But yeah. even in the Tiffany, you know, I, I in my trademark class yesterday, we did a search for Tiffany goods, and in some cases, the price differential was a little hard to guess. You know, it was sort of hard to know clearly um, whether what you'd be buying was going to be so clearly counterfeit because it was five bucks or whether it was, you know, in the $50 range, which could perfectly legitimately be a used Tiffany good. Um, and so I think it's hard to craft the legal doctrine that would get you to a point that says um, competitors selling products under this name are okay if the price differential is significant enough. Well, so even, well, I think it's not that. So let, I mean, I guess just sort of two reactions. I mean, first of all, I mean, I, Part because he was echoing me, but I don't agree with Felix. So he's uh, channeling me, right? But I mean, yeah, I think I think it does. It, it highlights the fact that there's significant un, uh, there's a significant lack of agreement about what the ultimate purposes are of trademark law. I think there's conflicting stories about this, right? So Mark Lemley and I wrote a couple of papers that were response to this. One is, in fact, you do find articulations of these non-core trademark harms in a variety of places. They're usually not taken seriously because they're kind of add-on arguments, like on top of the core things. And so I think what we argue is that they need to be taken seriously. They need to be like engaged, and we need to figure out what the, to what extent they're right. But I also think that, I mean, part of the reason that everybody talks about luxury goods is because all the secondary liability cases are luxury goods cases, right? Which kind of makes you think, well, maybe this isn't really about an infusion. Maybe this is about something else, right? It's all Gucci and Louis Vuitton, that kind of stuff. But let me just say, as a plug for thinking about this more as a negligence matter, uh, thinking about this as a negligence matter would be sensitive to the question of whether these are luxury goods or whether it's not, right? So that if this is this is a knockoff of a drug or if it's a knockoff of uh, of shampoo, then you would be sensitive enough about the context to say, well, here the price differential is not that significant, so the L is higher, right? Or the probability is higher. So you could account for all those things by thinking of these ex explicitly as uh, negligence cases in ways that you can't if you just adopt wooden rules that say something like. It listen, if the price differential is high enough, then that's... Right, and, and I think arguing against myself, I think you could, um, and arguing in favor of my um, suggestions made in prior writings, I think you could have a situation in which a disclaimer, uh, this is in fact a copy and does not come from Gucci, gets you to the place where people can buy the product for the incorporation of the trademark. Or do you think about things like merchandise, right? Like, so if you yeah. go to the Notre Dame bookstore, Every single piece of authorized merchandise has a little tag on it that says this is officially licensed merchandise, right? Yep. So if you just had a rule that said you can't use that if it's not officially licensed merchandise, and this goes back to Chris's point, is, is that the confusion's endogenous, right? You just train consumers right. so they had to look for that if they wanted to know if it was legitimate or not. Let's think about other questions we've got. Uh, other questions for the panelists? Yes, ma'am. Something completely different. So in the interest of full disclosure, I'm Chief Trademark Counsel at Intel, and I have an issue. I have. I heard you all trying to bucketize harm, but nobody's mentioned what you even constitute. You know what constitutes an infringement in this case. And I've had concerns for years now over uh, infringement now encompassing what we really mean to only be counterfeiting and piracy. So if you're going to analogize the trademark stuff to the copyright stuff, you have to have something easily identifiable. And I've received letters from people who say you've got this partner page on your website and they're infringing our mark and they're talking about standard infringement and I don't want to be put as a secondarily liable person in the position of trying to now, you know, apply the sleep craft factors to somebody's infringement. And I don't see anybody, you know, trying to say what they mean, you know, the, the term infringement's bandied about and we have, you know, this EU criminal directive where they're trying to say intentional infringement is, is criminal. Yeah. 
And so I have a real, and act the same thing, sloppy language. I have a real problem with people using infringement when they mean counterfeiting and piracy. And in this instance, I don't want to be held secondarily liable because it's a standardized infringement that I can't tell. I'm not here to substitute. Can I just say that the, the government a lot is looking to collapse them. infringement and counterfeiting. Mm -hmm. For example, you, you'll see in government prosecutions the government arguing in, in, in criminal counterfeiting cases arguing, well, once we establish that the mark is identical with or substantially indistinguishable from the registered mark that the mark holder owns, we don't have to show confusion because confusion arises ipso facto from the similarity of the mark. It might be that the thing has a disclaimer on it that says this is not Gucci, or it might be that it's sold at some table in Santiago for 15 bucks and nobody but a dummy would think that this was the genuine article, but that doesn't matter, and judges are letting them do it. And in the other direction too, right? They're also saying that their courts are saying things like what it means to be identical or substantially indistinguishable is likely to cause confusion. Yeah. Right, which is of course really alarming because the whole point is it's supposed to be a higher standard for criminal law, but yeah, no, it doesn't it doesn't work that well. But I, I take your point, right? I mean, these cases are a lot about counterfeiting, so the rules get built that way. So even if you just think of like a what I think is sort of a standard trademark infringement case where it's not counterfeiting, but it's a pretty closely related good, you can get much further from that, right? You could talk about uses of marks in in in, in creative content. You mm -hmm. talk about uses of marks, and the further you get from the core, the more sloppy, the sloppier it is, right? And then dilution is like not even on the chart. Yeah, right? and and so the, the test that I'm proposing actually takes that into account because what's a reasonable precaution would be very different when it's an obvious fake as it is when it's a close question as to whether it's an infringement or not. <coughs> so if it's a close question, and how can I possibly apply it sleek uh, sleek craft? Well, then you in that case you might say, look. The, the brand owner is going to have to come forward. They're going to have to make a declaration uh, that it is infringing, uh, and then they're going to have liability if I take it down. It's found to have been taken down properly. Uh, you know, I've had cases of counterfeiting, or at least what I think of as counterfeiting, where there's a one-letter difference, and I've seen defendants say, "Hey, it's not a counterfeit. There's this difference." And of course, where you draw the line is very tough. Counterfeiting is infringement. It's an exact. It's an exacerbated form of infringement. But I think it's, you know, if you think of it as a Venn diagram, it's the smaller circle, maybe with fuzzy edges, within the bigger circle of infringement. And the nice thing about the test I'm proposing, you, people don't like it because there's not a bright line, but what it allows is for courts to recognize that you have to look and see how much knowledge is there, what do you know, when is it obvious that you should take these precautions, and for something that's very fuzzy, the kind of precautions you need to take are very different, and indeed may only be notice and take down. And that's and unless the technology gets better to the point where there's some way of, of dealing with that, or unless a brand owner says, "Look, every uh, Gucci product I sell is going to have you know, some kind of a hologram, and if it's not there, it is absolutely not real." Then you're making it easier for the online community. Then you say to the online community, "I'm giving you notice as Gucci that if you don't see the hologram, it's not real." Um, and you've got to have a photograph that shows the hologram there. And those are, you know, I'm only asking you set up a rule that says have the photo. And, you know, that's the that's way you can do it. So you can see how the test I'm proposing is one that's not designed to say we've got this one rule that says if you don't have specific knowledge, you're free and clear. Because Stacy's students could probably come up with all sorts of business models that would be a disaster for. Uh, consumers, not just brand owners. Brand owners, by the way, are often on both sides of these cases. Many of my clients get ridiculous cease and desist letters, and we have to defend as well as prosecute trademark cases. So I, it's a very fair point, Ruby, and I think the point is giving the courts this flexibility will give the courts the, the ability to say where do the precautions have to be. Um, well, uh, we are in our appointed hour. I have a couple of closing remarks, but before I get into those, I do want to thank the panelists for sharing their thoughts. and. I also just want to give a special note of thanks to uh, the Stanford Technology Law Review. Um, we had a conflict with, that we identified early with our conference that we're putting on tomorrow at Santa Clara University. <laughs> and uh, we were able to work it out where we had these two events sitting next to each other. And it was very kind of them to be willing to, to adjust to this date. I think it worked out well for everybody. And so I really appreciated that. Um, we are now scheduled for a break, and actually a fairly lengthy break. So this is a good chance for us to get a chance to talk with each other, a chance for you to continue to engage the panelists and uh, other. Um, and Holly, do you want to say where people should go next? Um, upstairs to the courtyard.